My name is Trudy Jacobson, and on behalf of this event's coordinating committee, I'd like to welcome you to the second Campus Conversation and Standish event this spring. I hope you will also be able to attend our last event of the semester on April 1st, when Dr. John Forsyth of the Psychology Department will speak on why it's hard being human, transforming human suffering with psychological flexibility. Today's speaker is Dr. Glyne Griffin, who holds the rank of professor in the Department of English. His topic is how the BBC served West Indian literature. Dr. Griffin's PhD is from the University of the West Indies. His work examines the literature and literary history of the Anglophone Caribbean in the context of post-colonial theory and criticism. His dissertation was titled Deconstruction, Imperialism, and the West Indian Novel. In 2016, Palgrave Macmillan published his most recent book, The BBC and the Development of the Anglophone Caribbean Literature, 1943 to 1958. Dr. Griffith has also a number of other writings, conference presentations, and invited presentations related to the BBC. Please welcome Dr. Griffith. Thank you, uh, Trudy, and, and thank you again, Trudy, uh, for inviting me, and thank you, uh, Dean Muggridge, for attending, and uh, I, I might not be th thanking everybody, but I'm thanking the, the people whose names I saw, uh, Tyler Norton, and, and all, uh, anyone who was here who made this possible and who worked out of the library, I really appreciate it appreciate it, your being here, and you, the members of the audience. I don't need to say that all of us are like super, super busy these days, so anytime anybody takes time out for something like this that isn't obligatory, uh, it's really to be appreciated, and I want you to know that I appreciate it. So my, my title is How the BBC Serve West Indian Literature, and uh, uh, of course I'm playing on that, on, on that verb, served, um, both in terms of how they presented it and, and how they, they assisted and facilitated it. I'm going to speak for no more than 40 minutes so that we have 15 minutes uh, for questions and comments. So between March 11, 1943 and September 7, 1958, the British Broadcasting Corporation, through its General Overseas Service, produced a literary radio program that was recorded at the BBC Studios Bush House London and broadcast each Sunday to an eager audience of aspiring poets and prose fiction writers in the English-speaking Caribbean. Listeners would gather around the Radiofusion unit or the wireless set in Barbados, Guyana, Jamaica, St. Lucia, Trinidad, and other territories in the region to discover if one or more of their submissions had been selected for broadcast. Hopeful writers mailed their submissions to the program <coughs> sub-editor Cedric Lindo in Kingston, Jamaica, and at the end of each month, after he had vetted what he had received, he forwarded his selections to the program editor, Henry Swansea, in London. Swansea then chose what he thought worthy of broadcast, and his final selections constituted the material that was read over the air for the benefit of listeners back in the region. The program was called Caribbean Voices. The BBC Caribbean Voices program paid writers whose work was broadcast, and by the standards of the day, the pay was very good. Indeed, evidence of the fact that most of the limited budget went to pay successful writers and those who read the material on air is that no recordings of the program exist. In order to keep production costs low, each week's recording was taped over the previous week's broadcast so that by the end of the program, no audio archive existed. Successful writers and aspirants who hoped someday to hear their literary efforts broadcast comprised the faithful audience. But there were other listeners as well. Sometimes the wider audience included those who were not aspiring writers, but ordinary Caribbean folk within earshot of the radio, who were intrigued by the captivating stories and other presentations that addressed themes, locales, and, and circumstances familiar to all in the region. Over its 15-year run, Caribbean voices had a significant influence on the development of literature in the Anglophone Caribbean. Indeed, many of the, right, the region's writers who had begun to establish their reputations during the post-war period were creatively and materially assisted by Caribbean voices and Henry Swansea, 
the program's most influential editor. The program, like so much else during the colonial period, was organized from London, but as a BBC enterprise that had significant cultural impact on what were then colonial territories, it was a literary program that faithfully represented the region to itself. Except perhaps for broadcast of West Indies Test Cricket, a regularly scheduled radio program such as this was quite novel for the period. This was so because the program comprised literary content that had been fashioned by those from the region and often in vernacular forms that were representative of the cultural and linguistic diversity of the various contributing territories. The organizational structure that had established Caribbean voices and funded it was colonial in orientation, but the program's content was, in the long run, antithetical to the very colonial enterprise that had brought it into existence. Here was the Anglophone Caribbean representing itself to itself via the intersecting media of print culture and radio broadcast at a critical historical moment when, with the end of World War II, the region prepared itself for decolonization and national independence. Yet another aspect of the Caribbean Voices story is the important role it played in foregrounding some of the defining features of Anglophone Caribbean literature in the post-war phase of its development. Radio technology, particularly during the 1940s and 50s, when infrastructure for travel between and among territor territories in the region was still quite limited, meant that the challenges of distance and space could be ameliorated by radio broadcast in a manner that no other technology at the time could so readily achieve. In addition, the presentation of literature, that is to say short stories, poems, and on occasion, drama over the radio, meant that the region's oral traditions were being pressed into the service of the literary. The written and the spoken word were united by radio technology to offer up artistic representations of regional culture and environment to Caribbean peoples. Indeed, as a result of this conjoining of orality and literacy in the form of a literary radio program, those listeners who were part of the demographic where literacy could not be taken for granted could nevertheless hear and comprehend the spoken word. As a consequence of the extensive reach of radio broadcast, a nascent literature was made more accessible regionally than any published book, magazine, journal, or newspaper could have achieved at that juncture in the region's uh, cultural development. The broadcast of literature via radio meant that such content could potentially reach those who did not have easy access to published material and those who possessed limited literary skills. In the early 1940s, Jamaican writer and social activist Una Marson, with the help of Rudolf Dunbar, a classical clarinetist from Guyana, organized a, f a feature program on the BBC's overseas service titled Calling the West Indies. Through the medium of BBC Radio and, and Marson's program format, servicemen from the English-speaking Caribbean who were based in London during World War II were able to send greetings to relatives and friends back home. After a brief while, Primarily as a result of Marson's initiative and interest, the program also began to include some literary and cultural features of interest to the, re to the region. And thus the stage was set for what would become a full-fledged literary radio program, Caribbean Voices. When Marson returned to Jamaica early in 1946 as a consequence of illness, the BBC briefly employed English writer Mary Treadgold to oversee the program. After Treadgold's short stint as organizer of the program from December 1945 to July 1946, BBC Overseas Service Director John Grenfell Williams contacted Henry Swansea to ascertain his interest in becoming producer and editor. Swansea agreed to take over Caribbean Voices. Henry Swansea was quick to employ Caribbean readers on the program, such as Samuel Selvon and Pauline Henriquez, George Lamming, and other London-based writers and artists. Indeed, an important part of his early critical sense of what contributed to the Anglophone Caribbean's uniqueness, at least from a literary point of view, was language and the peculiarities of idiomatic expression. And here's a quotation from Swansea. 
it is certainly true that the dialect, uh, the, 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 the dialect, the accent and the, tur and the, the turn of phrase, uh, the spoken language was extremely rich. I always remembered phrases such as their eyes made for, end quote. However, Swansea's sense of what contributed to the uniqueness of literary submissions broadcast on the program was much more nuanced than a, a superficial interest in the would-be exotica of regional dialect and idiom idiomatic expression. In 1946, for example, during his first year as editor, he addressed a letter to his submissions agent in Jamaica explaining the reasons for rejecting a number of the scripts that Lindo had forwarded to him from Jamaica. I'm gradually working my way into the stockpile of Caribbean voices and now return various manuscripts which I do not think we should like to use. As you will see, they include several classes, patriotic poems, sweetly pretty poems, and finally, the occasional uh, exiles writing about conditions which have nothing to do with the Caribbean. On the whole, I think they all have something in common, and that is a complete absence of local color. That seems to me the greatest crime in this series, unless, of course, the writer is a genius with a universal message. Swansea intended much more than the mere use of local dialect and idiomatic turn of phrase when he referred to local color. His idea of the necessity of local color in the submissions read on the program was linked to the artistic value of the truth of representation or verisimilitude, and simultaneously to the notion that any possibility of universal truth that might be discovered in the literary manifestations of the author's imagination was itself a product of the work's rootedness in the local and the particular. In, his early let in this early letter to Lindo, therefore, Swansea was already beginning to establish important criteria for the program, and he was clarifying some of his expectations for future submissions. His insistence on the local would on several occasions run counter to what some writers in the region construed as appropriate material and context for their creative expression. And yet Swansea's artistic vision was sufficiently Catholic that many of the aspiring poets and novelists who were not part of an elite coterie of writers in the region managed to have their work read and critiqued on the program. As John Figueroa states, quote, one of the great contributions of Caribbean Voices was that it offered an outlet to all and sundry as any full list of its contributors shows. And in doing this, it executed an odd twist, an inversion of what would then have been considered the proper metropole-periphery relationship." End quote. Thus, a salutary effect of Caribbean voices as a consequence of Swansea's editorial criteria and his sensibility as a critic of the developing literature was that the program, the program often served as a foil against what some aspiring writers in the region construed as the elitism and middle-class snobbery of certain literary coteries. Where some such writers might have had their efforts disregarded because of their outsider status at home, here it was that they were being offered a chance at insider status by means of a BBC radio program broadcast back to the Caribbean region from London. With the foregoing as a sort of preface, I'd like to turn now to some aspects of the over overall shape of the program as a result of Swansea's design. In The Pleasures of Exile, George Lamming suggests that for him, there are just three important events in the history of the English-speaking Caribbean. He lists these as Columbus's entry into the region in the 15th century, abolition followed by indentureship in the 19th century, and finally in the 20th century, the use of the novel by the region's writers as a means of investigating and representing the inner life of the colonized. In proffering this list of significant historical articulations, that helped to frame the region's culture. Lamming suggests that, quote, the world met here, and it was at every level except administration, a peasant world, close quote. I want to pay a particular attention to Lamming's notion that this Caribbean world was fundamentally a peasant world, except at the level of colonial administration, and to link this assessment with what he goes on to say about this post-war cohort of prose fiction writers. Lamming states, 
the education of all these writers is more or less middle class Western culture, and particularly English culture. But the substance of their books, the general motives and directions are peasant. One of the most popular complaints made by West Indian writers against their novelists is the absence of novels about the West Indian middle class. When we consider Lamming's observation in the context of Caribbean voices, we begin to see that the program itself embodied many of the contentious, if not contradictory, forces associated with colonialism and empire. This circumstance, consolidated over the eight years of Swansea's editorship, had an enduring impact on the cultural imagining of a post-colonial Anglophone Caribbean. Furthermore, this literary emphasis on the rural and urban underclasses, combined with the representation of various territorial vernaculars, a consequence of the popular interpretation of Swansea's call for local color in the literature, to produce a view of imagined community across the region that was distinctly localized in the context of peasant and working class characterization. Additionally, this imagining of regional community as fundamentally peasant and working class helped to subvert, subvert a middle class vision of the soon to be post-colonial community that was closely aligned with the Federation's view of the decolonized region. As such, the ill-fated West Indies Federation was already imaginatively challenged, even before it took formal political shape, by the consolidation of a view of the future decolonized region as distinctively peasant and working class, at least in terms of cultural articulation. This perspective was to some degree a consequence of the shaping of the literature emanating uh, from the region and of its wide regional dissemination via Caribbean voices. As we know, the West Indies Federation as a failed national experiment survived for only four years from 1958 to 1962, having officially come into existence in the same year that Co Caribbean voices concluded. However, as is true of most such political formations, the groundwork for the establishment of the experiment had commenced decades before the conclusion of Caribbean Voices. Consequently, there is more of an intersection in terms of the scramble for ideological terrain between federalism on one hand and territorial nationalism on the other than is initially apparent. In addition, beyond, even, beyond such uh, abstract intersections, there were individ individuals such as Arthur Creech Jones and Anthony Martin whose administrative colonial work included both the BBC and the federal negotiations. Arthur Creech Jones, as Secretary of State, had administrative influence over the colonial office and therefore over, British, over BBC broadcast policy. He also chaired the West Indies Conference on Federation held in Montego Bay, Jamaica in 1947. Anthony Martin served as a BBC program organizer for a decade and a half. And he also traveled throughout the British West Indies in January 1959 on behalf of the colonial office to promote the interests of the Federation. As such, the years of Caribbean Voices broadcasts, though preceding the political formation of the Federation, represented critical years for the shaping of the ideological terrain of post-colonial nationalism in the region. Whether Federation's advocates were fully aware of it or not, Caribbean voices had the inadvertent effect of rendering inhospitable the very imaginative ground upon which the idea of Federation sought to sow the seeds of regional nationalism as a discursive concept. Echoing George Lamming's observation above, Belinda Edmondson, Edmondson's text, Making Men, Gender, Literary Authority, and Women's Writing in Caribbean Narrative, also advances the argument that Victorian Britishness served as the ideological model for a regional middle class. Although, as her book title indicates, she is much more concerned with the discourse of gender in the formation of the regional writer. Nevertheless, like Lamming, she highlights the significance of the idea of Britishness in the formation of the writer in the region and emphasizes the importance of comprehending the British Caribbean as a fundamentally discursive construct. Edmondson states, quote, the West Indies, and even the name alone, Columbus's error, it's, it's, it's the Indies in the West, <laughs> an oxymoron, 
the West Indies, as the region was and is still called, was somewhere else. Not Europe, not Africa, not India. This somewhere else-ness has become a central trope of West Indian discourse, with its attendant notion that the space of the West Indies is more metaphorical than it is material. And indeed, what exactly constitutes the West Indies, the Caribbean, as many prefer to call it now, has always been hazy. If the space that constitutes the Anglophone Caribbean was always fundamentally discursive and conceptually more metaphorical than material, as Edmondson argues, then the discursive construction of a post-war imaginative community in the region was certainly as indebted to a literary construction of nationalism given the reach of Caribbean Voices broadcast, as it was to any other discursive mode. Literature, then, was not a supplement to the intersecting political and economic narratives helping to shape the region, but was instead a fundamental actor in that discursive shaping of the region's post-colonial imaginary. Part of what helped to make literary discourse so significant in the shaping of the region's post-colonial imaginary was the unreality of the Caribbean as represented in a long tradition of colonialist narratives. As Edmondson rem reminds us, um, the, the, the image of the West Indian space as amorphous, sensual, and chiefly metaphorical established the terms of the discourse of Victorian England with its West Indies colonies. This relationship with Victorian England in turn affected the first generation of West Indian writers um, in their efforts to define West Indianness, in which geographical unreality, cultural lack, and racial inferiority all converged to define the terms of writing. As a response to this hegemonic colonialist representation, the post-war generation of writers wrote back to the imperial center with the significant assistance and influence of Caribbean voices and did so in ways that sought to contrast and counter this would-be geographical unreality with a fictive but no less specific and influential alternative mapping. This is the context in which we might better comprehend George Lamming's assertion that for the most part, this particular generation of Anglophone Caribbean writers produced novels that were peasant in motive and direction. The peasant is synonymous with the land, with the agricultural soil underfoot. But in the British Caribbean, where colonialism by its very nature meant the material dispossession of the colonized, most obviously in terms of landlessness, the post-war writers of the region articulated the conditions of coloniality and began the process of imaginative reclamation of the soil underfoot by artistically highlighting the peasant. This is what Lamming is describing when he states in The Pleasures of Exile that, quote, it is the West Indian novel that has restored the West Indian peasant to his true and original status of personality, close quote. The critique of colonialist discourse that necessarily preceded the region's narration of an imagined post-colonial community was rooted in the literature written by this post-war generation of writers. The emergent literature imaginatively grounded itself in peasant experience as a means of metaphorically taking possession of a landscape that at that historical juncture was itself symbolic of the material dispossession of the colonized. The figure of the peasant functioned symbolically beyond any narrative concern with characterization to stand in for landlessness and dispossession in the British Caribbean. And this symbolism in turn represented a, a literary critique of colonialism. I don't think it's coincidental that post-independence, when you look at the lyrics of most of the the, 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 the um, what do you call it, um, the, 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 na the national anthems of these territories, almost all of them say something about land and the importance of land. Thus, in terms of Edmondson's proposition that, quote, the struggle for West Indian self-definition became fundamentally tied to the use and manipulation of key ideas embedded in the actual langu language of Englishness itself, the figure of the peasant becomes one such key idea in the development of Anglophone Caribbean literature. The peasant's assumed mode of speech, Creole, functions linguistically within the literature as a means of critiquing Englishness, 
even as the writers were, drawn, were drawing upon Victorian models of authority and knowledge to fashion themselves as Anglophone Caribbean authors. The peasant and the urban poor functioned there not only as character, but also as a metaphor for anti-colonial sentiment and as the idiom of counter-discourse within the text of this cohort of Anglophone Caribbean writers. Henry Swansea's call for Caribbean voices, submissions that exhibited local color, managed to tap into this vein of literary discourse, and the effects of that edi editorial policy were disseminated across the region. Drawing upon the various territorial, territorial creoles as critical linguistic and cultural resources, a significant portion of the writing broadcast on Caribbean voices imagined the post-colonial community to come as existing within a vernacular tradition. Such writing sought to link language and the language of Englishness with peasant elements that it associated with a post-colonial national culture. Edward Said, for example, reminds us of the importance of such linkages as a strategy of anti-imperialist resistance. Said proposes the quote, the concept of the national language is central, but without the practice of a national culture. From slogans to pamphlets and newspapers, from folk tales and heroes to epic poetry, novels, and drama, the language is inert. National culture organizes and sustains communal memory." Close quote. One example of such conjoining of national culture and language in a Caribbean Voices broadcast, an intersection clearly intended to invigorate national language and avoid any potential linguistic inertia, is Louise Bennett's poem, Bands of Killing. Bennett's vernacular poem was broadcast on June 11, 1948. Indeed, it was the second occasion during Swansea's tenure that Louise Bennett's, Bennett's poetry was read on Caribbean voices. Bands of Killing employs Jamaican Creole to interrogate the perspective that would seek to delegitimize the creolization of English in Jamaica. That is to say, the nationalization of English by Jamaican folk. The poem offers insight into the blindness of the colonial perspective a perspective that, in this case, sought to remain oblivious to the diverse Creoles constituting accepti acceptable British English at the imperial center, while disparaging the Creolization processes at the periphery. Illustrating the point made by Said above, Bennett's poem not only uses Jamaican Creole to conceptualize a national language, but it also draws upon ele elements of Jamaican folk culture in a manner that organizes and sustains communal memory. This is illustrated in the poem's reference to two popular Jamaican folk songs, Linstead Market and Comeback Liza, where the relevant lines of the poem read as follows. If you can't sing Linstead Market and Water, come a me I, you be half a top sing all Lang Syne and coming through the rye. As Lawrence Briner observes, Bands of Killing uses Creole to assert the dignity and respectability of Jamaican English. Briner further acknowledges the significance of Swansea's editorial practice regarding innovative work such as Louise Bennett's poetry. Quote, Indeed, the inclusion of Bennett in Caribbean Voices was most impressive, not because she was female, but because her poems written in Jamaican dialect and intended for public performance were generally dismissed as entertainment. Apart from this prescient editorial decision by Caribbean Voices, critical recognition of Louise Bennett as a serious poet did not come until the mid-1960s um, as a result of uh, scholar Mervyn Morris publishing on Louise Bennett uh, an article that became a sort of seminal uh, article on her work on reading Louise Bennett seriously, first published in four installments in the Jamaica Gleaner newspaper in June 1964, and then republished in a scholarly journal, Jamaica Journal, in 1967. Uh, so, so, so there wasn't serious recognition of Bennett as a, as a poet uh, until this essay, um, well, or, or, or until uh, her, her, her broadcast on Caribbean Voices and then this essay. At the Commonwealth Arts Festival in London in 1965, Louise Bennett was placed on the program among the, among the folk singers, not the poets. As I've indicated, a significant number of poetry and uh, prose fiction submissions sent to London and broadcast during the early period of Swansea's editorship 
met his call for local color by representing the vernacular speech of the peasant and working class characters located in specific territorial and cultural context. In addition to the work of Louise Bennett, several poetry submissions broadcast during his tenure highlighted specific territories and localized cultures, including those that sustained a markedly territorial rather than regional nationalist tone. During one program in March 1948, for example, Caribbean Voices broadcast the poems Jamaica by Mickey Hendricks, This is Jamaica by Carl Rattray, Trinidad I Am of Thee by Barnabas Ramon Fortune, My Sweet Barbados Home by Olga Holt, Portrait of British Guyana by Frank Dalzell, and Trinidad by Sam Selborne. Where, where Swansea emphasized imaginative renderings of Caribbeanness rooted in the soil beneath the writer's feet, the Federation's advocates sought to discover a means of reifying the landscape in terms of a collective mapping, albeit without relinquishing the idea of Anglophone Caribbean geographical space as amorphous and chiefly metaphorical, to recall Edmondson's phrase above. This circumstance meant, of course, that one of the problematic characteristics associated with Victorian England's discursive rendering of the region could hardly be countered directly by means of a federalist imaginary. In order to facilitate a federalist construction of nationalism that remained discursively indebted to Victorian middle class notions, Anglophone Caribbean geographical space needed to be imagined as a composite space with a reliance on representations of regional geography that remained amorphous, in short, that remained discursively Victorian. If therefore, as Edmondson argues, there were three elements that characterized the colonial discursive rendering of the region, namely geographical unreality, cultural lack, and racial inferiority. Then the effort to produce a federalist discourse in the region found itself reliant on a logic that could only focus its anti-colonial energies on the two remaining elements of that Victorian discourse. That is to say, the notions of cultural lack and racial inferiority. Such a logic drew upon British middle class ideology to counter both colonial notions of would-be regional deficiency by overlaying racial difference with a sort of Arnoldian, Matthew Arnold, a sort of Arnoldian culture of middle classness. In the text, Bonds of Empire, West Indians and Britishness from Vic Victoria to Decolonization, Anne Spry Rush suggests that the official BBC approach to regional development sought to attenuate matters of racial difference by highlighting middle class ideas of respectability. Quote, the significance of race within the great British family was thus downplayed as represented in the programs on the BBC. And to a great extent, the category of race was disabled in the colonial service department itself. Yet class remained important in particular middle class notions of respectability, a form of egalitarian snobbery typical among British intellectual progressives of the period. That was the norm at the corporation. Anybody, no matter what their ethnic or geographical background, could be welcomed into the fold as long as they valued the middle class perspective, and in particular, the BBC's policy of cultural uplift. It is not then surprising that those persons who worked with or for the BBC's colonial service, regardless of whether they were native Britons or West Indians, almost without exception identified themselves as middle class." End quote. Thus, official BBC policy managed to strategically engage the long-standing colonial discourse of purported racial inferiority and cultural deficiency in the region without decidedly undermining that discourse. It did so by offering the overlay of British middle class respectability and cultural uplift as a way out of that particular colonial conundrum. If local territorial cultures in the region were deemed deficient because they were produced out of retentions and practices associated with the untutored peasantry and the urban poor, the very stuff that Swansea's program highlighted and validated then the middle class project of cultural uplift across the region would replace such purported lack with the standardization of middle class ideals and perspectives. In terms of literary development, 
Such standardization would likely include a preference for the use of standard English and textual content that valorize the middle class worldview. The Federalist perspective indebted to this approach sought to address the problematic colonialist rendering of the region as racially inferior and cultureless by transposing middle class values and mores shaped by Victorian Britishness onto the region. As a result, these two egregious aspects of colonialist discourse were never critiqued frontally by the Federalist articulations of Anglophone Caribbean nationalism. The Federalist view of Anglophone Caribbean community lacked purchase when confronted by articulations of identity and belonging that were presented in specifically racialized and working class terms. Ironically then, Swansea's ideological position ran counter to such official colonial policy and to the Federalist view of the region. And his aesthetic choices for Caribbean voices often revealed not only his different perspective, but also his impatience with efforts to valorize and cultivate such Victorian-derived middle-class tastes in the region's burgeoning literature. Swansea was willing to take risks for his beliefs. And his comment, as he reflected on his years with the BBC, offers a glimpse into his views on colonial uh, politics. Let's see. Um, I think I, I, think I might have miscued there. Um, so, so here's uh, Swansea's uh, quote in an interview uh, that I did with him uh, many years ago. Uh, an odd passage through life which might explain something to the alert. The key, I think, has been my sympathy with the different peoples brought into contact by an imperial structure, perhaps too much linked by politics and economics, and not enough by art and culture. Indeed, Swansea introduced his final broadcast in October 1954 with the following statement. As the time comes for me to say goodbye to the program, one idea which I thought needed expression is a program frankly illustrating the tensions in the Caribbean. Tensions social and personal which are, I believe, at the root of the drive for self-expression when they are fruitful tensions. Many of the unpublished poems we are going to read will not be liked, but they are part of a reality nonetheless, even when they are most extreme. Discontent is sometimes aimed at the provincial life of the working class, end of quote. The theme uniting the selections Swansea chose for his final program was the West Indian predicament. And the broadcast included poems by A.N. Ford, Carol Morrison, Derek Walcott, and several others. Many of the poems examined the colonial legacy of class and racial tension in the British Caribbean, as this stanza from Derek Walcott's poem, Hatred by Moonlight, illustrates. Being so buffeted by change, by race, by hatred, for when the soul is hated, hatred of self becomes a kind of faith, and hate of others will not be abated except by rebellion or death. Swansea's vision for the program and the region's literature meant that he often disagreed with Cedric Lindo in Jamaica, and at times with his London-based associate critic and commentator, Arthur Calder Marshall. He was certainly aware that his contrasting perspectives created difficulties for him, and he was cognizant of the fact that his critical emphases facilitated the sort of nationalist perspective in the developing literature that was conceptually more in keeping with territorial nationalism than with the form of regional nationalism associated with the Federalist perspective. As Anne Fry Rush states, referring to Swansea's editorial practices, quote, nationalist voices were not uncommon on the program. And in later years, Swansea himself suggested that his openness to West Indian nationalism might have contributed to the BBC's decision to transfer him to another department. When historian Elsa Govaya offered her assessment of the Federalist story during her 1959 introduction to the Federation Day exhibition, she stated that, quote, Federation has appeared to be the means by which West Indian independence could finally be achieved. This appeal of federation for self-government has been strongest among the middle class. In the earlier struggle for our political rights, it was perhaps enough to be anti-British. Now that we face independence and the immense problems that it will bring, 
it has become absolutely essential that we should know whether we are West Indians." End quote. Here, Govaya acknowledges that the Federation's appeal was strongest, strongest among the middle class, suggesting not only that there was a need to persuade other constituencies in the region of the efficacy of federalism, but also that anti-Britishness was not sufficient to produce a persuasive narrative of post-colonial imagined community. The question of whether the great majority of peoples in the Anglophone Caribbean imagine themselves as belonging to a future federated community or to, a particular, or to particular national territories to come was by no means a settled, manner, a settled matter. The fertile ground of, of heterogeneous imaginings of post-colonial futures in the region would likely nurture and pr produce whatever ideological seeds had been scattered most widely and the seeds that had been most widely dispersed in the guise of narrative tendencies were those of territorial nationalism. Not only was the narrative of territorial nationalism more widely disseminated across the region than the Federalist story, assisted, as I have been suggesting, by Henry Swansea's Caribbean Voices, but there were also other quite conscientious anti-Federalist narratives during the same period, structured in the terminology of racial difference. For example, in 1958, Dennis Mahabir, editor of a journal called The Spectator, a literary journal in Trinidad, <clears throat> Mahabir argued that under federation, the integrity of the Indian community in Trinidad would be threatened by regional migration to that island nation. Quote, with unrestricted immigration, it is likely that the bulk of West Indians from the small islands will flow into Trinidad and it is quite likely that the pressure on the Indian community will increase. The Indian population in Trinidad is just a quarter million. That is, we are just one third of the total population of Trinidad. With British Guyana, another territory uh, with a large Indian population, with British Guyana out of the Federation, this majority will be considerably reduced." End quote. The concerns expressed here are instructive in at least two ways. First, the focus on Anglophone Caribbean racial difference, as revealed by Mahabir's statement, demonstrates the critical distinction between a concern with representations of racial difference as the dominant aspect of cultural cohesion and national belonging versus the federalist narrative of middle class cultural uplift serving as a kind of deus ex machina to suppress potentially disruptive racial tensions in the discourse of national belonging. Here we can recall Swansea's final broadcast and his introductory remarks suggesting that many of the poems heard would not be liked but were significant because they addressed social tensions in the region and particularly dis the discontent regarding the provincial life of the working class. He must have been aware that the cohort most likely to be displeased by such poems uh, that fortnightly address regional difference and conflict would be the intelligentsia of the middle class. His ideological stance suggested that he understood that such social tensions in the region that had been produced by a protracted history of colonialist policies and practices could not be comprehensively addressed by the overlay of a transposed middle class Britishness. One could not simply draw upon old colonialist epistemologies to produce in the words of the Guyanese poet Martin Carter a quote, a quote, a free community of valid persons, close quote. This is also the recognition implicit in Elsa Govaya's assertion above that poised on the threshold of decolonization, Anglophone Caribbean peoples needed to discover what it was that drew them together as a national community. To simply construct the idea of imagined community in the region as a fundamental opposition or other to British colonialism would result in a Caribbean sub subjectivity that foreclosed on cultural and social heterogeneity in order to adhere to the very colonialist epistemology of unitary subjectivity that had been central to the colonial worldview. Swansea's ideological and editorial tendencies revealed his comprehensive notion of Caribbean diversity, not only in terms of race and class, but also linguistically, as seen in his unsuccessful attempt to bring the literature of the Francophone and Hispanophone Caribbean into the Caribbean voices fold. His vision of Caribbean imagined community, expressed through his particular interventions in the developing literature, 
was of a regionalism that could simultaneously maintain a sense of collective belonging and a deep engagement with the local and the particular. Perhaps such a possibility exists primarily, if not solely, in cultural endeavor. And perhaps this is the service, even today, that Caribbean literature provides the people of the region. Thank you.